Hello everyone, I am Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity or if you will, human centricity. It may take us five years, ten years or more, but we're patient we're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Okay, we're back. We're back. And hopefully for a new season, also a new year. And this will be our fourth season if we count both uh, those in, in English and Spanish. And we have with us Maciej Sawatsinski. He's the CEO of Peewick Pro, an ad tech and martech expert, founder of several successful companies, online privacy rights advocate, and a big proponent of more conscious data use and a healthier digital advertising ecosystem. Now, for those who don't know it, Peewick Pro is a privacy focused analytics platform that is often cited as an alternative to Google Analytics. Let's get started. Maciej, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, great uh, being here. Very good. Look, I'm going to jump straight to the point. And there's this report that Piwik published um, a few weeks back, which is called Marketing Technology and Privacy, a forecast, a forecast for uh, 2022. The, the predictions from more than 30 experts or top experts, they 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 vary, but they include a mention to data transfers and the future of data transfers. Uh, do you think that's probably been one of the most uh, hot topics to deal with, uh, particularly given the events in the past few days? Yeah, well, when we are putting together this report and uh, we invited like 40 different experts from marketing, technology and privacy space. Um, we we wouldn't have thought that uh, in the meantime, like just just uh, recently, uh, Austrian DPA will actually make a ruling and say that uh, Google is becoming illegal, and it's the ruling is based on the data transfers exactly. So uh, basically, the uh, transfer of uh, personal data such as uh, cookie identifiers or IP addresses uh, from EU citizens to to the US, and that was one of the trends that we that we put in the report. But we wouldn't have thought that uh, like just a few days after the the, the new year uh, there would be the actual ruling published. And what do you think about that? So um, you know we've we've discussed. Con- consent you've discussed consent in many in many environments and um and it seems that we keep getting stuck in that debate do you think that we can really get valid true consent we have this debate all the time right and you know if we ask properly then what's the sample size can we work with that sample size so in your experience uh, do you think there really is an avenue where we ask properly with no dark patterns, proper consent, and yet we have a good sample size, a good enough sample size? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, there are two things here, like proper consent, and I'm all for it. And uh, I think we can get it. And it's like, you know, uh, all the, here the regulators are pretty clear. They always like say that the consent should be clear. We should have clear yes, no, no clicking three different buttons to get to the no. Uh, so I think I'm not worried about this part. The part where there is a lot of discussion and it looks like the regulators actually are going in the direction that is sensible is the uh, collecting um, uh, analytics data because uh, that's the backbone of the data-driven marketing. And as you said, like with small sample size, it's it's hard to make uh, good decisions and your business becomes less competitive and Europe can become less competitive than the rest of the world. Uh, but here, uh, frankly, I think there are some good movements. So in France, there is uh, exemption from consent where they keep the French CNIL keeps the list of analytics vendors that 
uh, can be used without the consent. A similar ruling was in Denmark, where they just said how the analytics should be collected. So you you should uh, you can do it only for uh, your own website. You cannot do cross site. You cannot build uh, profiles. Uh, but then you can use it without the uh, consent and. This rules out using Google Analytics, but it's uh, it's uh, you can still use uh, tools like Pewik Pro and yeah. other privacy-friendly analytics platform. And I think that's a that's a great direction because it's not so intrusive, but on the other end, it gives marketers some data to work with. That's very good. So you touched on something super important, and I, I've put a lot of time into explaining that, and that's really useful. As you said, uh, Neil. They've been doing this for many years. So in 2013, they had this cookie sweep, as they called it, and they started to audit websites. And they, for the first time, they published at least. And at that point, even ICO in the UK had published similar guidelines, not so clear about how analytical cookies were less intrusive and therefore, you know, sort of the level of, of uh, risk was lower. But that list that you're referring to, which is super important, this is key. And the fact that you can have analytics, as long as you don't keep data for that long, in the case of Neil, they've always been tying these to, or they, they used to tie to 13 months for some, you know, some sort of a decision somewhere. They said it shouldn't leave, cookies shouldn't leave for longer than 13 months. And then you shouldn't be able to deduplicate, as you said, so no cross uh, cross-site measurement, and then also no integration with like CRM and, and other environments. So that's great news. And in the e-privacy regulation uh, in the latest draft, we have this article 8.1.D, where there is already an exception codified for this matter. So that's perfect. You could have analytics as long as you're not bringing the data or deduplicating the data with any other any other environments and finally we can have tools that don't require a cookie banner which is heaven for many people right for many of us so paywick pro the way i said this this could be a great opportunity it's a great uh, solution for that my question is given that scenario then even paywick pro and, and other tools like paywick pro would lose the extra features that many marketers are attracted to, right? The whole idea of measuring campaigns, the whole idea of customer journey measurement or integrating these data with other things, and the whole idea of, of the duplicating. So in that balance, right, what we sometimes try to discuss, what is better? Do we have a very wide coverage of the audience so we don't need banners and 100% of the audience is covered? Or do we go deep with a small subset and with them, we use that subset to measure what works and what doesn't. What's your view in that? Do you see a future with that dichotomy? Do you think Pewik Pro and other solutions will rather go in the other direction where there's less integration and more value in the aggregate, playing with aggregate data? How do you see that future? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a there's a lot to unpack here, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it's it, it's super interesting topic. So. Um, first of all, um, uh, I want to refer first to what you can, what you cannot do with this consent. So you can still analyze a customer journey within a session. So like, you know, you can see what was the marketing channel that brought the user to the site. How did they use the site or digital product? And it's like 90% of valuable data that marketers use today. Uh, still, there is this thing of like building profiles of users and connecting it to other data. And for that, you need consent. And uh, what we do, for example, our approach is that um, in our defaults, because there are so many flexible settings that we offer, but the default that we, we suggest is that you still display the consent banner because you may need it for other tools, for example, for your marketing automation or for remarketing, etc. So it's not that the cookie banners will go away because for everything else, like uh, oh, like eighty percent of marketing stack still needs consent uh, because it's uh, creating uh, profiles and uh, and uh, collecting personal data. But when we have this consent, what we do is for that subset of users, we have simply more data in analytics. And we 
combine, let's say, the best of two worlds. So on aggregate, we see the full audience and we can go deeper uh, into those profiles that actually gave the, the consent. And I think that's a uh, I think that's the, that's a way to go uh, in the end because you you get the maximize uh, the value out of that. Um, I you can segment it further. So first, see what's the anonymous audience that's doing the the what the the identified audience with consent is doing, but you can also combine that, and that's uh, that's a really nice uh, data set to to work with for marketers. Very good. Sounds like a good good idea. Good plans. And there's been that question out there, which is, you know, pulling from that, does that subset of people, so people who do consent to the deeper analysis, because in the end, as you say, you're right, like there's so many tools and there's so much going on that you still need a, a consent banner, let's put it like that. So it's like we're not going to escape that hell. <laughs> so if we still have it, then there's been that this appreciation out there in the market that people who tend to consent should not be representative of those that tend to not consent. And this is important. It's all about, of course, you know, the value of the sample and statistical significance when two groups seem to be very different. And, and so this challenge, I guess, will exact, will be sort of bigger the more we get to a clean choice, because in the end, the sample tends to be smaller. Of course, the easier it is to say no. And given the latest fines to Google and Facebook in France, precisely, because there wasn't a clear question as to accept all versus reject all, and the more we get towards that and avoiding you know, a second layer where you hide let's say that convenience has always favored consenting. If convenience is on the side of not consenting, then will we get, do you envisage that a point where perhaps it's not worth even asking because the trouble that people have to go through, you know, to simply allow you to build profiles across all of these platforms or do programmatic or behavioral targeting, perhaps it gets to the point where few people could believe the accuracy of that, you know, of that model, given how small the sample turns when you ask properly. Do, have you seen, to get to, to a question, have you seen uh, sample sizes go down with these decisions slowly going down? I mean, definitely when you have a proper consent, as it should be by law, uh, the consent rate is slower. So it's like, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30, 40%, maybe 40 is even too high. Um, and uh, some, some, some of the uh, companies, uh, they take pride that they have their users consent 80%, but actually they didn't have choice. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the way it was built, like the, you said, like convenience wins. So if we make it convenient to consent and we make it very inconvenient not con to consent, like uh, most of the people will not go this extra mile to, to, to withdraw the consent. So the consent rates will go down with the proper consent implementation. But on the other end, um, I think like it's, we, we think always like, of the consent, like we go to the website and we receive consent banner and we say yes or no. But what about like building the brand's uh, trust with the consumer, like engagement, etc., and then asking about them? Because in the end, uh, like I think the the whole point with uh, uh, consent requirement is that our data will be only. Uh, kept and processed by the brands that we trust and that we regularly visit or regularly use. And uh, for that group of users, I think we'll have the consent because if we're a client, we will be in the CRM, we'll consent for processing our data for the purpose of fulfillment or providing service. So I'm not worried that this sample will be too small, uh, but uh, definitely like if we talk about like companies that uh, make money on the data, they they are in a little bit uh, trouble very because good, they don't good. have their direct relationship with their consumer. Like they, they don't like consumer just come to read an article or like 
uh, they are not even like a, a publisher, but they are just protectology provider and they have no right to, to get uh, this data. So let's say that, that something happens, which is that now people start refraining from using Google Analytics, even though we know how painful it is to remove any code from websites. We know that, that there's, there's a lesson about convenience there too, right? In yeah. tagging websites. <laughs> And, and legacy code and so on. But imagine that people do actually, you know, take their time and make the effort and start worrying about the fact that at this point, Google Analytics has a big problem because it's not just that you need to gather consent because you are using, you know, you're going beyond that exception, both the one in the privacy regulation in the draft and the one, you know, in, in, and the, and the ones listed by Denmark and France. So the problem with them is, of course, that because data is being sent to the US, then standard contract clauses at this point, they cannot be used. Uh, if you were to rely on consent, because it's for, a, for the transfer, it has to be explicit consent, which is the super qualified consent that needs like a double, a double factor, a two factor verification, which would be a terrible pain. So assuming that people start sort of slowly going away from Google Analytics, we get into a space where we have tools that are more local, store data locally, that for starters seems pretty obvious, or perhaps, I don't know, GA has a version where they store data in Europe. But this sort of localization happens. What would be the next step? So what do you see as the next step in analytics if you can, I don't want to unveil your secret, uh, you know, sort of product, roadmap, but what do you see as the future in web analytics or digital analytics or optimizing, you know, digital assets? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I will uh, maybe first uh, answer the, the part about the Google Analytics because uh, yeah. the ruling was about Google Analytics, but this is much broader problem. It's uh, not on, like, I think the regulator and uh, the uh, the actual complaint was about Google and Google Analytics because it's so popular. But uh, the same problem applies to many other big tech products, uh, as well as uh, to to smaller US companies that uh, that uh, have similar practices. Uh, so, say Google was just a, a boy to be <laughs> in this fight, <laughs> exactly. So it's it's not like you know other tools uh, does not have the problems, but everyone now will think, okay, how we can make it better. Uh, second part is the problematic part is that even if uh, Google changes their ecosystem and host data only in Europe, which I don't believe that will work because there's so many interdependencies with their advertising stack, uh, this does not solve the problem fully because they are still, uh, as Google Corporation, they are still uh, under Cloud Act, and this is this uh, yeah. uh, act that the European Union has problem with because uh, U.S. government can ask for any data, and the the company has to give it out. So you you have to really have truly European or non-U.S. companies uh, providing your service, uh, uh, and then you are not under the Cloud Act uh, jurisdiction. So. So that's the 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 mm. the, the first part, um, and uh, secondly, like what will happen in the analytics? Yeah, I think that this the uh, the market will become a bit uh, more fragmented. There will be more competition, and I think that's a good thing because yeah. usually when you have more players competing and not just one that had like eighty five percent of the market share, uh, you will have more innovation. And if you yes. have more innovation. Uh, everyone will benefit uh, from that in the end because uh, otherwise, like, you know, there's no point in competing if Google takes everything and they, uh, let's say you pay with your data and you get the service for free. So I think that's, that's going to foster some innovation in this space. And there, there are many things that you can do. Like there's more data sources that are not like just uh, personal data. So we can combine them. Mm -hmm. You can provide like better insight with some, uh, let's say some automatization of the insights and uh, creating recommendations. Um, so there's there's still, I think there's still a lot that can be done that is positive in the analytics space that will bring value. And it's not that we are now losing part of the data and actually analytics will uh, become like less uh, useful for, for everyone. 
Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. I think you've you've taken it to, to a much more logical place. So thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, something I was thinking as well is that you, you're right. Of course, when Max Schrem started the whole sort of mission, and he's on a, on a lifetime mission, right? He's destroyed Safe Harbor, Privacy Shield, uh, you know, uh, SCCs in a way. So when he started... In this recent uh, campaign, again, uh, sort of um, going against Google Analytics, he also did go against Facebook Connect. And it is expected that some decisions will also come up shortly with regards to, to Facebook Connect. And that does affect plenty of very small businesses that are now trying to make a living. And this is also a big dilemma. As you were saying before, it is true that large brands will have the trust of the consumer. Therefore, consent will surely be granted at some point. But what about what's happening now? So there's this huge long tail of DTC, direct-to-consumer e-commerce players, many of them on Shopify and other platforms. And they, by default, because they're on Shopify and these tools are provided to them, many of them, they just have Facebook Connect because Shopify has this agreement with Instagram, Facebook, Meta. So these are, again, mom and pop stores. They don't have many resources. So out of the box, they just go and say, here's Facebook Connect, here's Google Analytics. It's very hard for them to gain trust. Most of them do not comply today with consent requirements as per MaxRAM's uh, claims. And of course, as per the, the law, the letter of the law. So what do we do? This is there going to be a divide between large enterprises that can gain this trust and small companies that can't even deal with the complexity of the law? How do we deal with that? Do you see a divide? Yeah, I think like the what would be the ideal outcome? Um, we don't want to like probably like have all the companies go through such discussions as we have, like what we can, what we cannot do. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, I hope that uh, this will simply lead the large platform providers like Shopify, but there are also a lot of like good platforms in Europe uh, that are e-commerce platforms to provide uh, to the small businesses the solutions that are compliant. So maybe they will have uh, it will fully hosted in EU. Maybe they will have a uh, possibility to like just do it with one switch. Uh, okay, this uh, disables Facebook Connect, but it enables some European alternatives or some... Yeah. Uh, it localizes the product for them. Yeah. And that's an opportunity for these e-commerce platforms also to differentiate and to, to cater to the market. So it's it's not like that they will uh, sit down and like, okay, that's your problem. And uh, uh, if you want, you can leave to other e-commerce platform, but we know you want because that's too much work. So uh, because we, we vendor locked you in in the first place. True, so I, I think th this could be the change. Um, it may not like be fast, but uh, I hope that this 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 will go into the direction that uh, in the end this will be better for the for the consumers that uh, that use these brands and and buy from these brands. Very good. So one last question, Mache. One last last question because you have been involved with other uh, pieces in the stack in the market stack in the past uh, through a clear code, right? So you you understand very well the whole uh, the whole stack. Do you see? These decisions, these these changes, affecting all the pieces more, or how do you see that? Right, there's been first DMPs, then the customer data platforms been on top. Some people see, you know, analytics as an extension of the CDP. When you go into the marketing clouds, they see everything as an extension of everything else, like Salesforce, Adobe, and so on. Do you see a world where everything is more integrated? Or because of these, some pieces are now more easily discarded and therefore there's more of a best of breed, uh, you know, sort of future. How do you see that? Mm -hmm. If there is a quick answer so to I, that. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I see that uh, there will be more integrations, but it does not mean that you choose best of breed and you just use the integrations between uh, them. What I can tell is that in the whole ad tech and martech space, there is a... Uh, a huge demand for making sure that we comply with the, the newest privacy regulation. And this is taken into 
account finally like because this this used to be like when i was starting in ad tech like almost 20 years ago it it used to be like uh wild west uh, of the uh data collection let's collect data let's think what we do with that later uh that has changed uh, significantly and uh, there is whole like privacy tech space in this martech landscapes uh that is uh, quite like there's a lot of companies and there is uh, a lot of investment in this space but also larger players are trying to find solutions that are privacy friendly uh there are not always are there are things like uh flock by google that's like actually uh, turned out to be even more privacy intrusive than the earlier solutions so uh there will be try and error but uh at least there are like companies are trying to find uh, solutions and adopt for that new fu- new future um still the, there's a long way like uh, the way like all the ad tech programmatic ecosystem is connected it's it was not designed with the way to like uh, like take care of the privacy uh, and uh, protection of the the profiles consumers yeah Achi, thank you very much we'll add a link to your report and to anything else you want to add later on we'll just add it to the, to the show notes thanks again it's been a pleasure i would go on forever so thank you thanks so yeah much. Thank you very much. It was great speaking with you and uh, I'm always happy to come back uh, and see how these predictions actually turned out uh, this year. Exactly. Thanks a lot.